So this is uh, something I'm telling you right in the middle of the lesson. This has never happened at a Spirit Church broadcast. My entire crew is recognizing what's happening here. We've had, during this broadcast, one problem after another. We've never had any problems like we're having tonight. It is one of the strangest occurrences we've ever had on set. It is because I believe today we are talking about the demonic realm. And so we've prayed. We're ready to do what God wants us to do. And I want you to know what you're watching today. It took warfare to bring this to you today. And I want you to pray that as you're watching today, that God would touch your life. God would touch your mind and touch your heart to give you understanding and that God would help you to keep your focus on what is being said so that you're not distracted, which is an attack of the enemy, by the way, from what the Word of God is teaching. Today, we take authority over that spirit that not only tried to do something here, but that's going to try to do something with you as you watch it. So in the name of Jesus, before this Spirit Church broadcast even begins, I rebuke every demonic power on everyone who's watching. I rebuke every demonic power on that would try to block what the Holy Spirit wants to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Now let's uh, get to Spirit Church. For the next several editions of Spirit Church, I'm going to be addressing the overall topic of spiritual warfare. Today, I'm specifically talking about the fall of Satan. Now, I usually preach on the Holy Spirit, prayer, the presence of God, healing, faith, miracles, and subjects such as that. And spiritual warfare is one of those topics that I consider to be a hallmark of this ministry. So for the next several weeks, I'm going to be going over topics that have to do with demonic beings, spiritual warfare, and the like. As we move through these topics, I want you to pray that God would equip you and help you to receive the word in full so that you can go and defeat the enemy in all areas of your life. Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in worship, and then we're going to get right into this lesson on the fall of Satan. And be sure to stick around until the end of the broadcast. I have a very special announcement, especially for those of you who call yourself Spirit Church members. Here's Stephen Moctezuma. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
I'll never forget one of my first encounters that I had with someone who was possessed by a demonic being. I walked into a small Bible study that was being held at one of my friend's houses. And when I walked into that Bible study, I looked around the room and saw that there were about 25, 30 youth and young adults assembled there worshiping the Lord. There was someone there playing an acoustic guitar and everyone was being led together with one voice in worship. And I'll tell you that the presence of the Holy Spirit was resting upon that Bible study in a very unique way. And as I was worshiping the Lord along with those who were there at that Bible study, I noticed someone walk into the room. It was a man who had tattoos and was dressed in a way that would make you think he was what they would call, I hate to use generalizations, but he was dressed like a thug. And when I looked at him, immediately I was able to see beyond the natural and the Lord gave me a heart of compassion for him. And when I looked at this man, the Lord began to speak to me about him. And the Lord told me, I want you to go across the room. I want you to pray for him. So I began to make my way during the worship across that Bible study group, moving through people toward my uh, person that I just saw. And when I began to approach him, the Lord began to speak to me more. And I knew that as I was approaching him, I was going to have a very real, very intense, and very spiritual encounter. I began to come closer to him, and again, I sensed this intensity in the spirit. It was a celestial conflict hovering about the air, and I knew that this was spiritual warfare. I approached the man, and I said to him, can I pray for you? He nodded in the affirmative. He didn't seem too enthusiastic to have me pray for him, but he agreed to let me pray for him nonetheless. I grabbed his wrist and began to pray in the Holy Ghost. I began to pray in tongues. And as I'm praying in the Holy Spirit, this man begins to tremble and shake. And as he begins to tremble and shake, his shaking grew more and more violent as I continued to pray until he was almost convulsing. And when I looked up at him, I saw in his face and his eyes a very dark, a very intense, and a very real hatred. I could see in his eyes that he hated me. His face began to contort and he bore upon his countenance a demonic looking face in that moment. And I'm looking at him, I'm still praying, he's looking at me and he's still shaking. And as he's looking at me, he begins to growl under his breath and I begin to pray more. Now he'll recall later, as he told me, that everything in him wanted to hurt me. He felt like murdering me. He wanted to kill me, he said. And I remember seeing this violent look on his face. And he begins to tremble even more violently as we're praying. I'm telling you, it just intensified and intensified and intensified. And so he takes his hand back as if he's going to hit me. And when he came forward, it was like someone stopped his hand. He recalled later that he felt somebody grab his wrist and he couldn't hit me. He was trying to lunge toward me and he couldn't. We prayed for him for several hours. There was no deliverance that took place that night. This is before I learned that demonic beings don't take hours to cast out of people. I do not believe that it takes hours to cast out a demon. But then I saw him a few weeks later. He had him come down to our church and he got delivered at our church, and it was a beautiful testimony. He still travels today when he ministers, and he tells people this testimony about how God delivered him from a demonic beings. I tell you that story to remind you that we are in a spiritual war. There are angels, and there are demons. There is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a God, and there is a devil. Demons are not metaphors for evil. They are not figments of literature. They are real, ancient, menacing beings that stalk about in an unseen world, seeking to devour all that God loves, and that includes you. But all of this began in ancient times. This clash, this war, began in the days of Adam and Eve. The scripture tells us in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, 
Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says this, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There are only two kingdoms of which you can be a part. There is the kingdom of God and there is the kingdom of hell. Do not fool yourself. Do not kid yourself. Either you are walking in the light or you're in darkness. There is no in between. There is no neutral ground. You are either a subject of the kingdom of heaven or a slave in the kingdom of hell. There are those who will say, I do not wish to serve the Lord because I want to go and be free in doing whatever it is that I do. And those who say such things are not aware that they are in fact bound by sin. If you don't believe you are bound by sin, I challenge you to try to stop. You'll soon find that you're unable to escape the behavior that you thought was completely by free will. Now, I'm aware that we do sin by choice and God holds us accountable for those choices. But in another sense, we are bound because of the sin nature, not because God created us that way, but because when we made that first choice to sin, we allowed that sin to enter our lives and we allowed it to subject us to darkness. Now, there are only two kingdoms and this has always been about dominion. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. God has taken you from the kingdom of darkness. If you're serving the Lord, if Jesus is your savior, you've been rescued from that darkness and you've been translated, the scripture says, you've been transformed, you've been taken to a new place, a new reality, a new way of living. This all began though, as a battle for dominion. This battle has always been about dominion. This battle is currently about dominion. There is nothing the enemy wants more than dominion in the earth. And I'm gonna show you today in scripture where this all began. I'm not going to focus today on the aspects of spiritual warfare. That's, in the coming weeks, we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, the attacks of the enemy, how to overcome the attacks of the enemy, the origin of demonic beings, and so much more. But right now, I want to focus today on this edition of Spirit Church on talking to you about the fall of Satan. Because if you can understand the fall of Satan, then you can understand this great struggle between man and the kingdom of hell for control, for influence, for dominion. This is about a power struggle. We see first in the book of Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7, the fall of Satan. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was there a place for them in heaven any longer. The great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast down with him. Now the scripture describes the devil being able to persuade angels to rebel against God with him. Now I want you to imagine this. Those angels had with their very own eyes witnessed for themselves the glory of the throne room of God. Now, if the devil could persuade those who have seen God, how much more powerful is his persuasion against those who have not seen God? We must be on alert against our enemy, the devil. The scripture says also in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 19, describing the same event, the scripture says, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. He said to them, 
I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Look, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus said that he was an eyewitness to the fall of Satan. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. It was almost a taunt from Jesus when he described his recollection of having seen this powerful being fall from heaven. So Jesus saw this happen and he confirms the words in Revelation that would later come. Now, I believe we can find more detailed insight into the fall of Satan and into exactly what happened in the scripture. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 16 say, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Now, Isaiah is contrasting the king of Babylon with Lucifer. So some would look at this verse and say, Brother David, Isaiah was not talking about Satan there. He was talking about the king of Babylon. And you would be right. But Isaiah is not just talking about the king of Babylon. He's also referring to Satan. What he's doing is he's warning the king of Babylon by contrasting his pride with Satan's pride and therefore warning that that pride will cause him to fall just as Satan fell. So it is at once a warning to a king, and it is also, secondly, a parallel. So he's drawing this parallel, comparing him to Satan, so we can see clues to the fall of Satan in the book of Isaiah. The same thing would apply to the message to the king of Tyre, which is found in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 14, where the scripture says this, Son of man, sing this funeral song for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Now, obviously, this is not just talking about the king of Tyre. Number one, because the king of Tyre was not in the Garden of Eden. And some would say, well, actually, neither was Satan. When Satan fell, he was thrown to the Garden of Eden, but he wasn't in the Garden of Eden before he had fallen. But that wouldn't be correct. In fact, the scripture says that he was appointed as the guardian of the Garden of Eden. Let's read that again. Again, that verse in Ezekiel, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. So Satan was a guardian in the garden of Eden. Now, this type of reasoning would lead us to want to know, when did Satan fall? That question will naturally arise. So when did Satan fall? We know, first of all, that Satan definitely fell after the creation of the earth because in the book of Revelation, it says that Satan and his angels were thrown to the earth. So the earth has to be created before he can be thrown to it. And I'm not going to get into the gap theory. For those of you who don't know, that's the theory that there were other worlds before this one that was described in Genesis. I don't believe that. I'm not a proponent of it. I've studied it. And I see that it holds no bearings on any actual reality as far as the scripture would portray. So I'm not going to even really touch on that today. And it's not important enough of a subject for me to delve into it entirely. I'm just leaving you a little footnote to let you know there's another idea on this subject, but I don't hold to that idea. Also, we know that this was definitely before the fall of man. So Satan fell after the world was created and before Adam and Eve sinned. Obviously, because Satan was in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. Now, this doesn't mean, as we just read, that Satan wasn't in the Garden of Eden in his proper state, because some would say, well, of course Satan was in the Garden of Eden, but he wasn't in the Garden of Eden until he was cast down, but that's not true. We just read in Ezekiel that he was in the Garden of Eden 
as a guardian. And in fact, Ezekiel is describing Satan in his glorified state before he had fallen. And if it's describing him in his glorified state as having access to Eden, that means conclusively that Satan had access to both heaven and earth. Just as we see in the book of Job, those angels are called forward. So then, we know that this happened after the world was created, but before man fell. So I believe that Satan had this access to heaven and earth for quite a while. We don't know how long it was between the creation of man and the fall of man. We have no idea. We don't know how long it was between the fall of Satan and the fall of man. All we do know for sure is that Satan fell after the creation of the world, after the creation of man, but before their fall. So Satan had gone in to tempt them. But when did all of this occur? What was the catalyst? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But what was the catalyst that caused Satan to rebel against God? Because you have to imagine this. Satan stood in right connection before God for all of eternity. Nothing had disrupted this beautiful connection between the angelic beings and the heavenly father. But we read in Isaiah that Satan said within his heart, I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. I will sit upon His throne. I want you to think about that. What was it that caused Satan to fall? Now, I know it was partially pride. I know it was partially foolishness. I know it was partially selfishness. But I'm asking specifically, and what I found in Scripture, it stood out to me. And it shook me when I really studied this. I found why Satan rebelled against God, his motive, what triggered him to do so. What made Satan say within his heart, I will be like the Most High God? Well, the answer, I believe, is found in a very famous verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Satan was jealous of you. When God created man, he gave to man dominion over the earth. And Satan, who had access to both heaven and earth, witnessed this special relationship between God and man. When man was created, for the first time in all of eternity, it entered into the mind of Satan that the creation could be like the creator. And he was jealous of what Adam and Eve had. He was jealous that they were like God. He was jealous that they had dominion over the earth. You know, Satan promised Adam and Eve that they could be like God, but they didn't realize that they already were like God. Part of the reason why Adam and Eve fell in the first place is because they didn't realize who they were. And Satan was jealous of this dominion that they had. So then, Satan knows at this point that rebellion is the way, the path, to a lower state of being. When he rebelled against God, God sent him where? To the earth. Who had dominion in the earth at the time? That's right, it was man. From the very beginning, listen to me, this is powerful. From the very beginning, it was always God's intention that Satan would be subject to man. Satan was punished to dwell upon the earth as a fallen creation, and there he was to be subject to the dominion of man. People often say, well, God would never give Satan a second chance. In fact, he already did. His second chance was to live in the earth. Think about it. He had not been banished to hell yet. He was banished where? To the earth. So Satan was to live under the dominion of man in the earth as punishment. 
That was Satan's original punishment. God had not yet created hell for him. God had not yet sent him to hell. He was punished by being sent to the earth. So then, Satan, out of jealousy, possibly looking down upon men, possibly having this condescending attitude toward men, remembering his former state, imagining I was an angel of light and now I'm subject as a serpent under the dominion of man? No, he wouldn't accept that. God gave him a chance to live in the earth. He rejected it. What did he do? He begins to tempt Adam and Eve. What does he tempt them with? He tempts them with knowledge. He tempts them with the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I have to digress here for a moment because many would ask, well, why would God put that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, in the middle of the garden if Adam and Eve didn't yet know good and evil? Well, this is a misunderstanding of what it means when the Bible says knowledge of good and evil. This was not knowledge or moral grounding that was given to Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit. They already had that. How could they possibly know that God is good unless they also knew what wasn't good? You can't know good without knowing bad. That's just illogical. It's not possible. They had a moral grounding. This term, good and evil, is what's called a merism. It's something that describes two extremes to fully encapsulate something that describes something in its entirety. For example, if I say I searched near and far, I basically am saying I searched everywhere I knew to search. If I welcome ladies and gentlemen, I'm welcoming everyone. If I say I searched high and low, again, I am saying I searched everywhere I knew to search. So this is a merism. Knowledge of good and evil simply means a vast amount of knowledge. So Adam and Eve wanted this for themselves. They wanted a vast amount of knowledge. In fact, it's quite possible that God would have later allowed Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or gain vast amounts of knowledge after they had grown to a certain state. We don't know. That's just speculation. That's just a speculation I've had when I look at that verse. But we do know that Satan wanted to tempt them. Why? Because he knew that if he could get them to rebel, that would put them in a lower state. Satan knew that he could never again climb to the heights that he had known. He could never again command the heights of heaven. He now was subject to live in a debased state. And so he knows now, I can't go any higher, but I can bring man lower. And Satan, by experience at this point, knows the path to a lower state of existence, and that is rebellion. This is why Satan tempted man to rebel. This is why Satan wanted them to eat of the fruit so that they could be brought to a lower state and therefore subject to his dominion. He wanted to take the dominion of Adam and Eve through their rebellion. So Satan, an angel of light, falls. Again, we know definitely after the creation of the world because the world had to have existed for Satan to fall to it. And we know this is before the temptation of, or the fall of Adam and Eve because Satan was the one who tempted them. So Satan fell, I believe, sometime while Adam and Eve were still in fellowship with God. It had to have been the case because the scripture points to no other clues. And so knowing this, we see that this battle for dominion has been raging for some time. And he wants your dominion. He wants your influence. Satan cannot have dominion. He cannot have influence unless it is through an individual. And so I have so much more to cover. We're going to get to more next week. You, I, I encourage you, be listening to these Spirit Church broadcasts. We have so much more. And I'm teaching this all out of my book, 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare to be released by Charisma. If you're watching this before October 4th, 2016, then it's yet to be released. If you're watching this after October 4th, 2016, then it's out now. And if you'd like to get this, you can go ahead and click on the image, which is an image of the book right next to me here. You can click on that link and it'll take you right to where you can get it. I want to pray with you now because we need to prepare our hearts for these teachings and we need to pray that the Lord would help us to take our dominion from the enemy. Maybe in your life, 
You've fallen for the temptations of the devil. You've given some of your obedience. You've compromised in your Christianity. And I don't believe that Christians can be demon-possessed. This is another lesson for another time. But I do believe that the enemy can take your influence from you or at least cause it to become stagnant by influencing you to be disobedient. Now, you are to be held responsible for your choices. The devil cannot take control of your free will. But we do need to be aware that the enemy is trying to influence us. Why? There's only one thing he wants. He wants your dominion. He wants your influence. You're going to take it from him by giving him no ground. You're going to take it from him by living in harmony with the Lord. You're going to take it from him through obedience. As you obey the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gains influence in your life. As you obey your flesh, your flesh gains influence in your life. As you obey the tauntings and temptations of demonic beings, hell gains influence in your life. It's time to take it back. The devil cannot influence a single thing unless he first influences a person. This is why when he wants to attack a home, he attacks the parents. When he wants to attack a church, he attacks the leadership. When he wants to attack the nation, he attacks those in government. The enemy goes for the head. And you, whether you see yourself as a leader over anything or not, have influence to some degree. You impact your family, your friends, and those around you. So the enemy is fighting. He's struggling to get from you that influence, to subject you to his rule, to subject you to his will. And only when you allow him can he take that influence. It's time to take it back. It's time to take back your prayer life. It's time to take back your devotion to God's word. It's time to take back your family. Some of you are watching this, your kids are gonna come off of drugs in Jesus' name. Your family is gonna get saved in Jesus' name. You're gonna come out of depression in Jesus' name. You're gonna come out of anxiety in Jesus' name. You're gonna come out of that sickness in Jesus' name. It's time to break the power of the enemy over your life. He cannot have dominion. It is so now and it will always be so that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You're going to take that power back. Come on, let's pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray for that one watching. Oh my goodness, I'm getting a flood here. Of There's someone watching, you're listening to music that you know is ungodly. I'm not talking about just secular music. I'm talking this music is demonic. I break that power off of you in Jesus' name right now. That spirit of anger that's tried to influence you. And I want to stop praying just for a moment to let you know, I got a lesson coming up on superstition because we in the church can become so fearful of demons. And I don't believe demons attach themselves to every little thing. And I don't mean to be superstitious. But in this case, there's someone watching me. You know what I'm saying. It's, I mean, I'm talking, this is not just, you know, debatable secular music. This is purely demonic. And it's caused you to become very angry and very paranoid. I break that power off of you right now in Jesus. You need to give your heart to the Lord. In Jesus' name, I break its power off of you now. Lord, we take back our dominion and we establish the kingdom of God in our homes, in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, in our places of influence, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every demonic stronghold. And I pray, Lord, remove that demonic influence from the house. Remove that demonic influence from their mind. I break it off of them now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to say it if you agree. Amen. I'm going to read your comments in just a moment. But first, I want to welcome the new members of Spirit Church, the new members of the Spirit Church family. There you are up on the screen. Thank you for joining Spirit Church. We love you. We are praying for you. We want the best for you. If you're a Spirit Church member, stick around to the end. I got a special announcement I want to give. And if you want to know how to become a member, then click on the link that's just about to appear over my head. If you're not watching this on YouTube, use the information at the bottom of the screen to manually find how you can become a member of Spirit Church. Let's go to the comments now. First comment here I'm reading today, Alani Chappie writes, David, what kind of Bible do you use? And may you do a teaching on how to study the Bible, please. Can you please reply? Thank you and God bless. Well, yes, of course, I'm replying right now. And I use primarily the New Living Translation and the King James Version. My primary translation is the New Living Translation. My secondary is the King James Version of the Bible. And I would love to do a lesson on how to study the Bible. In fact, I might just do a blog on it. Um, but if we get enough comments asking for a specific lesson on how to study the Bible, it won't necessarily be a spirit church lesson. I might do a live uh, broadcast where we can interact together and I'll show you how I study the Bible. So if you'd like me to do that, let me know in the comments section 
below. And here we go. Another comment from one of our YouTube viewers. Praise Jesus for his amazing work that he is doing through you. Knowing the difference between conviction and condemnation is so important. Well, yeah, these comments are coming from our video, The Conviction of the Holy Spirit. And it is important that you're able to tell the difference between conviction and condemnation. Knowing the difference between the two will change your life. Be sure to get to that video after this one. Another YouTube commenter writes, Wow, I felt the power of the Holy Spirit move while I was watching this video. I joined Spirit Church. Well, welcome aboard. We love you. We're praying for you, as I always say. And I really want to tell you, welcome to the Spirit family. Here's a YouTube channel called Birthday Wishes. They commented, another great teaching. I love how you have the presence of God on your videos. So many people are afraid of looking weird for being different, but I think it's what Christians need more than ever, especially for this time period. I couldn't agree more with that. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes this ministry so distinct is the presence of the Holy Spirit is manifested in a very unique way on our videos, at our events. And that's really all that's special about us, I believe. I want to encourage you. I'm not really charismatic. I'm not really a gifted speaker. What draws people to this ministry is the presence of the Holy Spirit that's on my life, on this ministry, and on this entire team. And that's something we really are intentional about cultivating. So we're glad that you're experiencing and being changed and transformed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here we have Maxwell Chegg, who is a first-time viewer, writes, Great teaching, Pastor David. I am 16 years old, and this is my first time watching you. Your teaching truly applied to me. Thank you, as I know this will truly help me overcome my problems. Jashan Powell writes, Man, you have changed my life with God speaking through you. God bless you, man. Well, we know that Jesus is the one who changed his lives, and to Jesus and Jesus alone belongs all the glory. I'm glad to know you're being blessed by the ministry. Amabel Alviato writes, Thank you, Brother David, for this beautiful teaching. And once again, you said this at the right time. How great is our Lord? Well, God is always on time. Here's a comment from Favor and Grace. God bless, Brother David. Hope you can do a teaching on fasting. May the Lord keep using you for His glory. Well, that is another great suggestion. If you'd like me to do a teaching on fasting, let me know. When we get through all the spiritual warfare and demonology teachings, which will be just in a few weeks, maybe a couple months, depending upon what pace I teach at, uh, we'll start to go into teachings on prayer. So I've just come out of a season where I'm teaching, I think I did about six to nine months on the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to do another three or four months on maybe two months, two to four months on demons and spiritual warfare. And then after that, I'm going to be hitting the subject again on prayer. So we got a lot coming for you on Spirit Church. Starla writes, this was awesome. Thanks for doing this, Pastor David. And Eclectic Beauty writes, I was just talking about this. Thank you, Lord, for sending me this message. Well, we're so glad that you're being blessed. If you'd like me to read your comment or question right here on the Spirit Church broadcast, go ahead and leave a comment here in the comment section below. Remember to be succinct. That will make it more likely that I read your comment. So I want to talk to you now. Please don't turn off that video. I want to talk to you for a second. This is my special announcement, but it's going to take your help. Others come out right and say it. I'm going to begin weekly meetings in Southern California. I'm not starting a church. I'm not becoming a pastor. I'm going to continue to be an evangelist. We're going to continue to do television and media and miracle services all around the world. That's going to be the main push of the ministry. That's the main foundation. That's what we do. But in addition to everything we're doing as an evangelistic ministry, I want to start discipling believers on a regular basis. It's going to be Spirit Church. Spirit Church will remain online just like this, but we're also going to add a Spirit Church location. Remember, it's not a full-on church, and technically it's not really a church church as you might traditionally believe it. It's people gathering together, worshiping the Lord in the biblical sense it's a church, but with all the we basically don't have a children's church or a youth ministry and, and Bible studies and such. It's a once a week meeting. And I want to do that because I want to impart to people personally. But we need your help in order to do this. If you're being blessed by this ministry at all, whether that's through Encounter TV, Spirit Church, our books, our events that we do in your area, many of you have come out to the events and we love meeting you there. You want to see the evangelism push forward. You love the miracle services or anything that's coming out from this ministry. Here's what I need you to do. Become today a $30 a month partner. The one-time gifts are welcome. They help, but we need $30 a month partners. We need 1,000 new $30 a month partners. And when we do that, when we get 1,000 new $30 a month partners, 
within just about two months. That's what I'm estimating. Once we reach the $1,030 a month partner, two months from then, we will be in a building, we'll be doing weekly meetings, and we're gonna build on what God is doing. We're gonna have a facility. I wanna do 24 seven prayer rooms. I wanna have those weekly meetings. I wanna make it like a miracle center right here in Southern California. So help me do that. Help take this ministry to the next level. I, I, I saw a vision that the Lord showed me of stadiums being packed and thousands coming to the Lord. You wanna be a part of that. You look at the ministries that, that grow really large and you say, wow, I wonder how that happens. Here's how it happens. It's in your hands. The Lord put it in the hands of the people. Yes, it's God's vision. Yes, He brings provision, but He brings provision through you. So you can be part of the ground floor. You can be part of the historic sweeping in of souls, the historic harvest that we're going to reap in this generation. So do that today. Become a $30 a month partner. I know you want to do it because your heart is for the Lord. And so I thank you for it. Do that today. Click on the link that's just about to appear over my head and go and become a $30 a month partner. Some of you could do more. Some of you maybe could do just a little less, but do it today. Don't hesitate. Don't delay. Help us get to that goal and take this ministry to the next level and help us continue preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, through international events, global discipleship, and worldwide television. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Hey fam, Stephen Moctezuma here. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel and to share our content. I hope you're enjoying all the content that we're sending your way. In addition to David's teachings and ministry videos, you can also join me on my worship playlist where I release a brand new video every week. Thank you guys so much for watching Encounter TV. God bless.